Um, I'm going to ask like nine different people to read short um, things uh, that are oral testimonies. So um, if anybody put your hand up if you're willing to do it. Oh, great. There's a couple of people. You're going to be Jesse Viapondo, Jonathan Pierres. Who wants to be Chico Fernandez? You want to be Chico? Okay. And uh, how about Mud Mill Charlie? There you go. Bring my glasses. Okay. Um, over here, okay. I have to read this. And I'm going to let you be Valerie. Valerie Denny, okay? There you go. Mud Mill. Okay. You're set. Okay, we need one from me. Um, okay, you're going to do one. And uh, would you do one? Which one do you do? This is short one. Vicky? And uh, I'll say the people's name before before you go on. You're going to be Jim. I'm going to be Jim. Okay. And I uh, need one more. George George Mandich. Who's going to be George? It's real big big, big letters. <laughs> I'm here. Can you do one? See, the truth is I haven't learned to read yet. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, there we go. Okay, so the person that has um, put us all to work uh, is uh, Dr. James Lane. Let's be here. He's our speaker this evening, and um, he is co director of the Kaimet Regional Archives uh, with uh, Steve McShane, right? And um, with Ron Cohen. Steve's oh, with the Ron archivist, Cohen. the curator. Yeah, yeah that's right. And uh, he's the author of uh, City of the Century, A History of Gary, Indiana. He wrote that in 1978. And then a couple years later, you came out with um, Gary, Indiana, Pictorial History. Was that That's right, with, uh, with uh, Cohen. Mm -hmm. With Cohen, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's where I saw his name. Huh? Okay. And uh, he's also written other things. Uh, and we'll go through uh, these a, a little bit. Um, Forging a Community, the Latino Experience in Northwest Indiana from 1919 to 1975. He edited uh, that volume. And um, he co-authored. This is, um, I assume it's a, a smaller uh, book on uh, skinning cats. <laughs> the Wartime Letters of Tom Kruger. Tom Kruger uh, was a Navy, a Navy SEAL who worked on Caterpillar machinery. So that's where the... Skinning cats comes Skinning from. Skinning cats. Okay. Good. Uh, he's also been editor of uh, Steel Shavings, and we have a, a lot of them up here tonight. And you, he's approaching 50 volumes. So can you imagine writing, editing 50 of these? Um, and some of them are heavier than that. Um, and if you read the current one. You'll find that Kaimet Revisited is in there on page 158, <laughs> along with uh, Sutton Lynn, who is, uh, anybody knows him, that goes back quite a few years, um, in, uh, in the steel industry. Um, and um, I just want to, um, before you start, I should have it mentioned, uh, you see the first thing in the uh, evening, we ask for announcements of upcoming things. And Valerie, I think you have, uh, have something. Yes, I just want to cordially invite everyone who is interested and available to um, our next event this evening. Um, you come to campus on, um, on Humanities Week. Fifth Annual CCSJ Humanities Week. So we have lots of events going on, and there's free food at most of them, which is why we were able to get some sandwiches for you folks. At 7 p.m. in room 200 down the hall, there will be a presentation on the uh, Pullman National Monument uh, by Professor Mark Casello, and specifically he'll be talking about some of the tensions between development and preservation. So it's it very much ties into the themes that we explore in Calumet Revisited, and I hope some of you folks will be able to see. 
I also want to mention, and I don't do this often enough, but Kevin Murphy and Joanne Potko, um, you know, film film this these events, and uh, the ones they do film uh, appear on Ollie's website. So if you ever miss one and uh, you wanted to check out uh, what the uh, uh, what was said that evening, uh, just check our website. And um, I have quite a few announcements. Um, the um, so sit down. in November <laughs> on, on November fourth, um, Ali is uh, co-sponsoring with uh, with Kymet College and uh, with the National Park Service uh, Museum on uh, research a research summit, and that will be in room two hundred, um, and. Uh, it will be an all-day event, and I've set out some information on this, um, and it's, uh, hopefully it'll, it'll uh, accomplish what we uh, set out to accomplish. I um, also want to mention that we have a wetlands festival coming up on May 28th and 29th. If, um, if anyone um, is a canoe instructor, kayaking, uh, we need some volunteers, um, but we, um, I, it's just really kind of introducing, um, uh, well, folks of all ages actually, uh, how to how to canoe if you've never canoed before, and uh, I remember we had someone that came out and kayaked, and she says, you know, and she was about my age, and she said, you know, all my life I've dreamt of going kayaking, but I've just never done it. And today I did it. She was really excited. Uh, and um, so that, that, this is our 16th annual one. And as part of that, uh, on Sunday morning at 7 a.m., we have a sunrise service. And um, we have an ecumenical choir. And um, in fact, the person conducting that this, this year is uh, Brother um, Benjamin Basil. Um, uh, but we are looking for uh, folks with uh, a good voice. And um, so if you happen to be one of it, and if you really like to go out at 7 in the morning on a lake where <laughs> no, nothing's around except you know, beavers and, and swans and, uh, and a fisherman or two. But that's about it. It's so quiet, and it's the favorite part of this two-day festival uh, that will be in the 16th year. And then, um, oh, part of part of our um, I forgot this um, part of our um, research summit in November um, is based on we're going to review some of the scientific studies that have been done on Wolf Lake since um, going back to the early 1990s. And I did this. I was going to get an intern to come in and do it, and I couldn't get one. So I went through all these studies over Christmas, and, and um, all the recommendations, and wrote them all up. And um, so we're going to find out which ones are, um, have been implemented, which ones have been ignored, and, and which ones um, uh, still hold promise. So that will be part of, and this is will be on our website, Holly's website. So, um, and then the last thing I want to mention is that um, on May third, we have Victor Cassidy, and he'll be here uh, to talk about his book, of Henry Chandler Coles, uh, the pioneer ecologist. And then in on September sixth, we don't meet during the summer. So on September 6th, well, uh, Sue Bennett, Chief of the Visitor Services Pullman National Monument, will be here to talk about her first 18 months um, in that position. So that brings us back. And so now we're going to talk about uh, steel workers. And uh, maybe we'll get into some of the environmental impacts of that as well. So Dr. Lane. OK, nice to be here. In, 1907, in, in 1970, after I hired in, so to speak, at IU Northwest, 
a neighbor of mine back in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia, asked if I knew what Gary was famous for. I said, steel. That didn't satisfy him, so I said, a black mayor. And he said, hookers. <laughs> but uh, that's a subject for another day, although, as many of you know, a uh, hooker is an honorable steel-making skill. Hookers work in billet mills where semi-finished casting products are rolled from ingots in that phase of the steel-making process. Anyway, moving to the Calumet region, I couldn't get over its blue-collar ethnic flavor. Virtually everyone I met either worked in the steel mill or had a relative who did. Some of my steel students were steel workers or had been, and for the most part were the first in their family to attend college. Their parents often as not spoke broken English. Soon after I arrived, labor historian Staunton Lind, a Quaker who was blacklisted from academia for traveling to North Vietnam during uh, America's longest war, convened a labor history workshop at a Glen Park storefront just blocks from the campus. Guest speakers included an eyewitness to the 1937 Memorial Day Massacre and rank-and-file activists purged from Union office during the Red Scare. At Lynn's labor history workshop, I met labor radical John Sargent, as well as Red Scare political prisoner back in 1950, Catherine Heindemann. The common message uh, from virtually all of them, and uh, the Lynn's put a book out, rank and file, based on that labor history workshop, was that unions had been weakened by bureaucratization, top-down decision-making, and tactics of thuggery against dissidents. I learned about Inland Steel uh, Union stalwart Bill Young, whose father had been beaten during the 1919 strike, and he himself was clubbed on the head at Republic Steel during the Memorial Day Massacre, when Chicago police killed 10 demonstrators. Young recalled, quote, they beat me pretty good, but I was on the picket line the next day. Bill Gales said of Young, he was a hell of a guy. If somebody came to him with a grievance, He'd pick up the phone, call the foreman, and threaten to do this and that. <laughs> he kicked tail. Ruth Needleman, in her book Black Freedom Fighters and Steel, The Struggle for Democratic Unionism, wrote, Bill Young was the only African American subpoenaed to appear before the House on American Activities Committee hearings in Gary in 1958. He was never called to testify because of an incident that occurred within earshot of the committee when Joe LaFleur, the government star witness, completed his testimony, Bill Young walked over to him with an outstretched arm as if to shake his hand. Young was a very large, very unforgettable man. LaFleur flustered, asked, do I know you? And Young responded, no you don't, but you named me anyway. <laughs> so as a result, uh, he was never called. Researching Gary's history, I learned about early non-union era working conditions in the mills for Eastern European immigrants, labeled hunkies in those days, who labored in unsafe conditions without hard hats or decent protective gear, 12 hours a day, believe it or not, seven days a week, resulting in what John Fitch called old age at 40. I researched famous Gary native sons like boxer Tony Zale, Gary's man of steel, whose strength came in part from being a steel worker, and actor Carl Malden, born Vladin Sekulovich, whose brief experience inside Gary Works caused him to resolve never to return. Historian Betty Balanoff demonstrated that U.S. Steel's recruitment and promotion policies were designed first and foremost to keep the nationalities and later the races apart. Striving to write a social history of Gary from the bottom up, I interviewed steel workers representing more than a dozen nationalities, including Mexican-American Paulino Monterubio. I was most interested in probing into ways he was discriminated against, both in the mill assigned to the coke plant, for instance, and outside of work. While this certainly 
happened, Monterubio did not wish to be defined as a victim and proudly showed me his union card, his citizenship papers, his World War II warden's hat, and family photos. And that was a real epiphany for me in uh, subsequent interviews. Speaking with Jesse Villapando and Pete Chico Fernandez, two students of mine, I further realized the pride steelworkers had and how their work did not totally define their existence. Growing up in the Block and Pensy neighborhood of Indiana Harbor in East Chicago, Jesse Villapando frequently heard the refrain, someday you're going to be in the mill, everybody goes into the mill. Jesse graduated from high school in 1950, served in the Marines, and became a welder at Inland Steel. He made good money, but it was a dirty job. Jesse Villapando told me, in those days, welders crawled around in grease. I'd crawl under the hot bed on repair jobs. He'd come out and be just full of grease and dirt. You're in all the rat holes. you never get rid of the grease. It was just packed in. My mother would have to soak my clothes in bleach in a separate container before she washed them. That grease would mess up washing machines. A lot of people would send their clothes to industrial laundries. Later on, you would rent your clothes. Here is a part of an interview I did with Inland Steel veteran and long-time Union griever Joe Gutierrez. In 1961, at 20, I went to the galvanized department, which was a world of its own. Even though it was near the 24-inch bar mill, the weld shop, the machine shop, and the 100-inch plate mill, and the spike shop, there wasn't much sense of unity. He identified with his department. They were islands unto themselves except for a common canteen. I got drafted in 1963 and went into the Army and came back to that department. I never expected to stay past the summer. My first union meeting, it seemed like a closed set of people and that they wanted to keep it that way. It looked like the mafia sitting up in the front. I was totally turned off. I didn't have the historical background in terms of knowing what the unions had done. That wasn't taught in school. The only people who had ever heard of you ever heard of was John L. Lewis. Unless your father was a steel worker, the average kid didn't know anything. The union was like that place over there. The company had taken advantage of the workers for so long because of poor union leadership. Most grievers eventually became foremen. People would be one-time grievers. It was a stepping stone. Chico Fernandez described working in the foundry and tapping blast furnace heats. The foundry was great in the summer, but cold in the winter. On the north end, there was nothing out there picking up, blocking the wind. Switches would freeze up. In the rain, you had to slide through the water, come out of the engine, and throw that switch. Sometimes it was so wet, I wouldn't bother to dodge puzzle, puddles. Once you're saturated, you're saturated. Some of the switches were <coughs> underwater, and I'd jump into the puddle. Then I got to the furnace floor. That's the hardest place to work. It's all physical, and you're always doing something. There's no lunch hour. You eat when you have time. Eventually, I moved up to first furnace man. I was tapping heats, which is a great job, except for the sulfur tap, the sulfur heats. Of 25 guys up there, I was the only one who wore a respirator. The others would wear a handkerchief, and that didn't do shit. Excuse that. That's what's in here. Okay. Here it is. Everyone's coughing, and I'm just standing back there like nothing, except it would bother my eyes. The melter told me one night, Chico, you're the only sissy up here that wears a respirator. And I told him, Jerry, I'm the only sissy up here that ain't coughing. It's an honor to be called a steel worker. <clears throat> when I put my occupation on a form, I enjoy writing steel worker. People know what a steel worker is. That's what I am. I am proud to be part of the steel workers union too. Many steel workers endured the inhospitable conditions so their offspring wouldn't have to follow them into the mill and instead be able to, for example, attend college. When district director Eddie Sedlowski admitted this truth in a penthouse magazine interview, it caused considerable consternation in official union circles. In the, uh, the mid-1970s, IU folklorist Richard Dorson began researching the folklore of steel. 
gathering oft-repeated tales embellished at steelwork or watering holes. Among the categories or motifs are delineated in Dorson's book, Land of the Mill Rats, which I have up here, were the old days, deaths and accidents, mill thefts, horse play, vandalism, rats, characters, lunch pail, anecdotes, and nicknames. Many of the nicknames had to do with people's physical features or ethnic origins. Dorson heard stories about people called Crazy Joe, Clean Mr. Tucker, Preacher Hughes, Cecil the Corn Popper, Hard Luck Herbie, Wart Man, and Mud Mill Charlie, to name just a few. Here's a story a worker told him about Mud Mill Charlie. Mud Mill Charlie worked in the coke plant, the dirtiest, hottest, meanest of the mills, and stayed there for 15 years because he made good money loaning a dollar for a dollar interest. On payday, the coke workers would blow their money on whiskey or broads or gambling and have to borrow from Charlie. He never had to ask them to pay because he had carried the biggest old 45. He would just put his hand in his pocket. There were fellows who never caught up because when they paid off their debt, they'd be broke and they'd have to borrow again. So there were guys who owed Charlie for 15 years. Chico Fernandez worked with one guy nicknamed Buff, big ugly fat fucker, and another called Bluff, big lazy ugly fat fucker. In a poem called Thirsty, Former steel worker Jeff Manis, now a Post Tribune columnist, wrote about mill rats he has known. Preachers, bikers, pikers, thugs, dinosaurs, and engineers, holy rollers, carpenters, melters, blowers, <coughs> too, hookers too, a college boy from What's the Matter You, lazy car and salamanders, steamboat jack and gerrymanders, lead and coke gas tough to hack, our snot and spit is always black. The time has come, I've paid the bill, 30 years in the mill. Among the many steel workers Jeff has interviewed over the years, some at my suggestion, was John Bianchi, who worked 38 years in Inland Steel's <coughs> coke plant. Manis, who once labored, in his words, atop the car carcinogen carcinogenic coke batteries of Bunning Lake, Michigan, wrote, Bianchi walks with a cane these days, he attributes that to years of working underneath the pusher and the door machine, changing shear bolts, and the countless times he carried a pair of 60-pound idlers to the top of the coal handling section of the coke plant. My students at IUN gathered tales similar to those collected by Dorson, with the addition of these two categories, sex and sexual harassment. As a result of the 1974 consent decree, women in significant numbers hired in be because they were subject to sexist practice and humiliations that led to the formation of women's caucuses. In fact, uh, this is a copy of the steel shavings called uh, Calumet Region Steelworkers Tale Tales. Anyway, local 1060 sick caucus leader Valerie Denny and I were both members of the Anti-Nuke Bailey Alliance, and she willingly agreed to be interviewed for that issue of steel shavings. Valerie of Millwright at a Gary Sheet and Tin Pickling Mill told me, I didn't get outright sexual harassment like touching. It was more like, well, I'm going to get you for my partner, and then we're going to go down the basement. Millwrights have sort of a cowboy image. It's a very macho outfit. It's really just an act. But at first I had no method of evaluating how serious it was. As a millwright, you carry a crescent wrench and a pair of channel locks all the time in your pocket. I'd think, well, I've got my wrench if anything happens. Clearly there's a pack mentality that goes on. You have a few outspoken people who set the tone. With the guys, the most outspoken leaders try you out and determine your mettle, and then it's fine. With a woman, every single person has to try you out. That's part of the reason it takes so long to get comfortable, because you've got to run through everybody's game. Everybody runs a game on you. For example, one guy's game consisted of first talking dirty and then putting up a Playboy pinup. I thought, should I make a big deal about this? Is it just going to encourage him? I waited until he was out in the bullpen and took it down and threw it away. He never put up another one. He probably knew I took it down, but wasn't faced with it directly and forced to respond. 
Then he started reading dirty books out loud. I wasn't morally offended, but realized that it was some kind of attack on me to make me uncomfortable. So I said the first thing that came to my mind, I didn't even mean it, but it worked. I said, sometimes I get the idea that you guys are all homosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> he stopped. He never did it again. Anyway, you all are doing great. Most women lost their jobs during the layoffs of the 1980s. Being the last fired, being the last hired, due to the seniority policy, they were the first laid off. I have a section on the Women's Caucus in my book, Gary's First Hundred Years, plus an article um, entitled Indiana Women of Steel in Traces Magazine. The Women's Caucus project led to a collaboration with Michael Zansky, a charter member of Local 1010's Environmental Committee, beginning in 1972, active during the Bailey anti-nuclear fight and as uh, was later president of Local 1010. We co-edited the Steel Shavings issue on rank-and-file insurgency in the Calumet region based largely on oral histories entitled Steelworkers Fight Back, Inland's Local Union 1010 and the sedlowski balanoff campaigns. The 1010 Environmental Committee under Ozanski's chairmanship became very active once rank-and-file leader Jim Balanoff won election in 1977 as district director, concentrating both on water and air pollution. Mike recalled, Oak oven workers were dying 10 times as often from lung cancer and seven and a half times as often from kidney cancer as other workers. So it was a health issue. For the first time in this area, steel workers stood up against the company's environmental blackmail. Elaine Kaplan of Purdue Calumet invited me to be on a panel with John Bruff, the head of pollution control for Inland Steel. I asked Balanoff and some others to come for moral support. Ruff was talking about what a great job his company was doing when Jim got up and said, Ruff, you're killing people at that goddamn coke plant. Ruff wanted to leave. It was all they could do to keep him from walking out in a huff. When U.S. Steel closed their open hearts, they claimed that if it wasn't for pollution regulations, they wouldn't be laying off so many people. District Director Ed Sedlowski went to the papers and said, hey, wait a minute, they closed the open arts because the BOFs are about to go online. It wasn't the EPA that shut down the open arts, but labor-saving technology and corporate greed. For several years, I was oral history consultant for projects initiated by Sandy Appleby at Tri-City Mental Health Center in East Chicago. One dealt with the psychological effects of layoffs on steelworkers. I found that most didn't miss the mills, just the money they earned there. In fact, some were subsequently rehired, and several took advantage of a labor studies swing shift college program and became students of mine. Working on a tri-city project on ethnicity entitled Pass the Culture, Please, I interviewed members of the Arredondo family. Patriarch Miguel was a union organizer at Lynn Inland and his son Jesse became president of Local 1010. That circumstance led ultimately in my collaborating with Ramon and Trish Arredondo on the book Maria's Journey, which I brought a copy of, and, and you can see uh, the effect of the steel mill on, on this entire family and their, their upward mobility. In an editor's note to a steel shavings issue covering the 1980s, titled The Uncertainty of Everyday Life, I wrote about the diminution of organized labor's clout exemplified during the record-long U.S. X lockout of 1986-1987. The fathers of Vicki Ray Dickerson and Sam Hamilton were laid off or forced into early retirement even before then. Vicki's dad was a 20-year veteran in 1984, who had been earning more than $30,000 a year. Vicki Ray wrote, My mother had never worked before in her life. She found a job at Harvey's in Lake Station. She disliked every minute of it, and her salary was only three thirty-five dollars an hour, but it supp supplemented the unemployment and subpay, totaling less than $300 weekly. Exactly one year after he was laid off, my father began subbing as a Portage school bus driver. Two months later, my mother quit Harvey's and became a substitute driver, too. A 
eventually they became regular drivers and the family was able to get on its feet again. Sam Hamilton wrote, My dad had been working for U.S. Steel since the 1950s, but was forced into early retirement. As this process was unveiling, I noticed my family changing. We had eaten out a lot. Now it was no more McDonald's. My family vacations were shorter and not much fun. My mother started to work, and my father began worrying out loud. He seemed always to be yelling at my sister and me and fighting with my mother. There were times when he would come home drunk and end up passing out on the couch. After he got used to retirement, things improved. Actually, many families were worse in shape than ours. I knew people whose utilities were turned off and who relied on food stamps. Many, po many people moved away to places like Houston. My students interviewed family members about how the lockout affected them. George Mandich told daughter Emily. A few months into the dispute, I'd come home from the picket line and lie down on our living room couch. You were just 18 months old and would climb up on my chest and promptly fall asleep for your afternoon nap. I too would doze or wonder how everything would work out. The saddest time was Christmas, not being able to give my family things like in years past and worrying that the company was going to make good on its promise to hire replacement workers. Fortunately, the ladies' group at our church helped out with a very generous Christmas basket. During the lockout, Norman Bickoff found occasional jobs with an outside contractor and worked part-time at a liquor store. He told Jim Lair that nobody else wanted to hire him because they knew that when there was a new contract, he'd go back to the mill. Jim Lair wrote, Norman stocked the liquor store shelves, cleaned up, and carried boxes to customers' cars. He wouldn't get home until 11.30. At times, his knees buckled on him when he was pushing himself too hard. His wife and two teenage children often stayed at his mother's for days at a time. He was so exhausted from working two jobs that he'd just come home and sleep. Poet William Buckley, an IUN professor for many years, told Jeff Manis, I was here during the 1980s when 60,000 steelworkers were laid off and they weren't rehired. People forget this. I had a woman come into my office and tell me that she had to drop out of school because her steelworker husband had committed suicide after being laid off. I saw whole families hitchhiking on I-65, heading back to the south where they'd come from. Some couldn't even afford a U-Haul. In the poem, Echoes on the Banging, Banging Rim of Steel, Buckley references Native Americans, the region's first residents, and implies that like them, steelworkers might also vanish from the scene. In the poem, Steeled Gary, Buckley used the word Bosch, meaning the lower tapering portion of a blast furnace and wrote, Big mill world of Poles, Germans, and Italians who hunkered down in camps, waiting for their timbered company cottages staggered to a northern wind, while heaters bathed in the Bosch. Let the first and last barges through, let the last boats through to the barriers. Five years ago, I suggested to colleague Ann Bailey that she research LGBT steelworkers after we realized that virtually nothing had been written on the subject. Her award-winning Steel Closets, Voices of Gay, Lesbian, and Transgender Steelworkers, which I have up here, based on interviews with 40 LGBT steelworkers, forced the USW bureaucracy to recognize that there was a problem and to take stand, a stand against discrimination. Ironically, that major contribution to labor history and her queer persona cost Anne her job at IUN. Richard Violet wrote this review of Steel Closets for Library Journal. America was forged in steel, as Bailey notes, it is both a material and a metaphor, a part of the idealized American spirit and that tough metal conjures up myriad images, molten rivers and glowing stabs, smokestacks, skyscrapers, and automobiles. Bailey examines a different side of the steel industry. In this traditionally masculine, tight needle, tightly knit blue collar milieu, homophobia is an ingrained part of the camaraderie. 
For most of these workers, coming out is not an option, and the job hazards are compounded by physical and mental health issues. Here's a few insights that I gleaned from her book. Mill workers feed on gossip and might brand a slightly effeminate colleague as gay, even if he isn't. When Anne asked Keith what it was like to be gay in the mill, he answered, I really can't offer an opinion on it because I'm not gay in the mills. As far as they're concerned, I'm straight. Fred has faced harassment and been ostracized for being candid about his sexual orientation. He told Anne, I look at my gay friends who are in the closet and I think they're sniveling little cowards and then they watch how I get treated and I can't blame them. Zach, outed by a girl he knew in high school, had his car vandalized, came upon crude drawings and hurtful words scrawled on his locker, and for six years was the object of ridicule. He developed a hard shell and a sense of humor, laughing at himself and dishing shit out to others. As he said, if you show that it's bothering you, people will jump on it and drill you into the ground. Transgender workers who couldn't hide their identity had, um, had it the hardest. Those best able to survive were women, often assumed to be butch, even if they aren't, who, who also proved their mettle. Work is dangerous, and people depend on one another to stay safe and alive. Fern speculated that since men fantasize about two girls having sex, their homophobia is restricted to men. Anne wrote, a fortuitous fit between lesbian orientation and street steelwork means that many lesbians seek out and thrive in mill jobs, whether they are open about their identity or not. As Kate put it, guys would rather work with me than some of the other guys because I'm a workhorse. For some gay women, working in the steel mill provides an opportunity to give full expression to their masculinity and get paid for it rather than punished. Assigned to remove large bolts from polishers, Gail worked with a sledgehammer and told Ann, I had a ball with it. You learned to do a lot of amazing things. It was fun. It was a job you actually woke up and enjoyed going to. To gain acceptance, women adopt a veneer of toughness. Nate told Ann, some of the ladies there were rough and tumble. They had to be. And some were almost as inappropriate as some of the men you know as far as sexualizing the environment. Harriet bragged that when a guy made an obscene gesture and said, suck my dick, she pulled her pants down and replied, suck my clit. One woman <laughs> stole Guy's air fresheners that had pictures of naked women, bragging that she found them titillating. Oceana, and these are made-up names by Ann, recalled elbowing a guy hard who touched her ass and replying in kind to backward guys who abused her verbally. And one more review of Steel Closets by Liz Kennedy. Bailey makes the steel mill come alive as a key shaper of the conditions of work and gender and desire. The mill emerges as a behemoth, lumbering into the contemporary world, engulfing all who cross its path. Bailey links the mill's physical isolation from broader societal movements through such things as the massive physical structure that workers enter through a gate, or the labor practice of the swing shift, which prevents workers from socializing, or hinders them at least, from socializing with outsiders, or the practice of showering before leaving to wash the plant off one's body. The separation is reinforced by the overwhelming timeless quality of the mill, since many of the processes and therefore the building designs are over 100 years old. So, uh, one more thing before we can throw it open, a poem that uh, Oz and I put uh, in the beginning of our uh, Steel Shavings magazine called Steel City, Stone City by Robert Buzecki that goes this way. Buzecki, Militich, Rodriguez, Kowalik, thousands of somebodies from all over the planet, names make them different. Blue shirts and steel make them family. Steel threads suspend, giant sea hooks from overhead cranes, steel coils sharp as razors reach out to slice the unwary, rumbling railroad cars and dump trucks, carelessness and exhaustion strike down others. 
The burial grounds not far from the mills now hold the steelmen. Their dates are carved in stone. Between the dates is blank space, their lives. Where they labored, at handwork, double shifts, sweated through their blue shirts, inhaled coal dust air, smelled the stench of burning coal and endured monster machines, and hammered, pounded, rendered, hauled iron and steel. This is not chiseled in the stones. Okay. So now, uh, thank you. So I'd be happy to talk about any things I, I mentioned or listen to anecdotes or um, additions from, from you all. I'm just a curious, how many people here have worked in steel mill? Okay. <clears throat> well, one of my intentions was to try to uh, provide images of, uh, of that place, which I was able to, to visit. Uh, Inland, used to had a, uh, used, Inland Steel used to have a family day, and uh, I got able to get in on that, even though I didn't really have any relatives there at the time. And then, uh, because of Swing Ship College at IU Northwest, uh, uh, there were tours of Bethlehem for faculty uh, in that program, and so I, I have toured uh, Bethlehem. In, uh, in 1976, U.S. Steel opened up uh, a, uh, uh, their plant, at least, uh, you know, uh, parts of it to, to visitors, and I didn't go on that, but I understand there, were, there was an amazing uh, interest in, uh, in visiting U.S. Steel during the bicentennial. So, so I have been in a steel mill, but probably haven't uh, seen the dirty, the dirty parts, the coke mill. Um, okay. Go ahead. Well, when I, uh, I worked as a supervisor at LTV, which is the old Youngstown plant, and uh, I ended up in a machine shop, and it frustrated the guys because they couldn't identify me until they gave me a nickname, and it was kind of tough on them because yet. He had to learn who I was. The obvious one is you pick on the person's spelling of their name or whatever, or their looks. But it, it frustrated them until they finally found a name for me. And I don't even remember what it is now. Uh, shoot, I, 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 <laughs> to I my face. Know. Yeah, Dorson, uh, Dorson's book is, is a fascinating one. And uh, he's a, a pretty world famous uh, folklorist. Uh, and uh, he brought this Gary group, as he called it, up to. Uh, their foray into the region again, as he, as he called it, and, and some of his stories are are pretty interesting. You mentioned uh, among the people you interviewed, Joe, Joe Gutierrez, among others. And Joe had become a, a fairly well established in, in Gary, at least I think, in the Gary area, a poet. Many of them became involved in the arts and in poetry and and possibly in graphics as well. After and some of the work they did was very powerful. Yeah, little Joe, as uh, as he was nicknamed. Um, also put, put together tales of steel workers in, into a, a published uh, uh, book. And, and I, uh, I remember interviewing him at, at his house and, and looking at his uh, quite extensive library uh, that included all, all kinds of books. And, and he's, he's in several Studs Terkel's books. I think working is one, uh, but I know he's in at least two, two different uh, books by the mentor of mine, uh, you know, the father of oral history, uh, Studs Turkle. John? Have you ever thought about doing anything in the waiting Robert Stella area with the, the uh, Amoco BP uh, workers? You know, we have, um, we have uh, oil, rec oil workers union records at the archives, and we have an archives volunteer, John Humarek, who's uh, very uh, active in the Whiting Historical Society, who has has done uh, some good work. In fact, I think what was it the 60th anniversary of the explosion, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, in June, I think it was, yeah. and he uh, wow. he was very he put a, a documentary uh, together about that, and has also uh, put together a four-hour documentary on Gary. Uh, so. So I defer to him, but 
but encourage encourage him very much to to publicize the, the many oral histories that he's already done. Yes. Uh, well, we've been working with the South Chicago Chamber of Commerce to try to celebrate the 180th birthday of uh, South Chicago, and the mill, of course, was the major employer. Uh, and while there's next to nothing left of the mill, the way the workers lived mm -hmm. is still there. There's still a lot of working class housing, and so we're hoping that we'll be able to set up something to commemorate that. We still have a stretch along Commercial Avenue, like whoever shopped along Commercial Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> we're hoping to be able to revive that uh, and capture some of the feel of that so that go back several generations to uh, make people feel comfortable. Also, we have the Steelworkers statue at Steelworkers Park at 87th Street and the lake. Yeah. And now the lake is now accessible to people who may have worked in the mill but were never able to get to the shoreline. Yeah. So, uh, so we're hoping to do quite a bit with celebrating Steelworkers there. Yeah, I remember when uh, Jeff Manis interviewed uh, Joe Gutierrez and he he ends the interview, and, and, and Joe still lives uh, near the mills, and and he he talks about driving away from little Joe's house, and this used to be something else, and this used to be something else, but Joe remains, and uh, and and everybody uh, from Jesse Villapando on, who, who grew up in that Block and Pensy neighborhood, you know, remembers. It nostalgically as as a as a melting pot, uh, you know, uh, where you had friends of all nationalities, and uh, that that it was kind of a cool place. So. Well, Jeff himself was a steel worker as well, and had been involved, in that. and then yeah. there's a whole crew of them who went through the programs after <clears throat> left the steel, who have become writers and artists in the group, and so they're contributing in a different way to the region now. But they're still those are steel workers who are doing that. To begin. Yeah. Yeah, Jesse Viapondo, um, who was the best student I ever had and the most appreciative person of, of college education, uh, who in his 60s became a, a, a junior high uh, school teacher, Mr. V. Uh, but he started the Latino Historical Society and pulled me into it. And through knowing him, I just got to meet the most fascinating people, Louis Vasquez, who, uh, whose nickname was Weasel. Because he was small, uh, he's like 92, and he still goes to every Chicago Central basketball game where I'll see him. My my son announces the basketball games, uh, and so I'll go and and still see Louis. He wrote. Uh, we have a special steel shaving that is his autobiography. He, he wrote it on like a thousand page of uh, mill paper. <laughs> on one side was stuff, and they wrote on the other side, and uh, it's just fascinating, you know, the the stories he tells. And um, and so many people I met through 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 Jesse. Uh, yeah, John. Have you ever have you thought about going back and revisiting educating in the region that steel shavings? Uh, yeah, uh, which which you're in. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I got to tell you, I thank you because you've given me immortality, <laughs> and for something I really didn't deserve. But it's it's like this when I read that. I thought that there was one thing that you really missed. You were hearing about we're hearing about painters and sculptors and writers, but you missed the judges and the lawyers. And I mean, we got one on the Indiana Supreme Court, Bob Drucker, yep. came out of the Northwest, and I think you know it's it's something that as an alumni of that place, I'm really very proud of. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it's funny because. Um, well, of course, it's the centennial of of Indiana is uh, 1816, but the IU centennial is coming up in four years, and so people are gathering to decide what to do about it. And and so I gave ten copies of that magazine to all these people who were trying to come up with you know ideas. And and like you say, yeah, in the in the 1960s at, at IUN, the, the young Democrats were very uh, active, so John, you know, people like John Bunsich were there, and I just visited George Van Til in prison last last Saturday. He doesn't deserve to be there, and and he was he 
he got into politics through coming to IUN uh, in the 1960s. Uh, Judge Barack, I mean, there's a lot of people I can say, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Miskowski. So, uh, so yeah, I. Uh, it'd be great, great to update all my stuff. <laughs> Uh, and I still, through my blog, I kind of do that. But, but I've got to tell you, that I think is just one of the things that I think all of these campuses have a claim to that they've really affected the footprint around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people, um, IU Northwest, uh, just to bridle a bit, probably had the second black studies program in the country. And uh, San, Fr uh, San Francisco State set it up six months before we did, but we had it running before they did. And uh, so there are scholars, you know, coming, doing research on that. Um, you know, we're very proud of the archives, uh, and we, we just had somebody from SMU uh, there for three days uh, studying Superintendent Wirt, who made Gary's schools world famous uh, back in the day. Did you have a question? I, I do. Um, and if you could just take us back in time a little in terms of helping us appreciate the worker from the moment he or she uh, applies, you know, in terms of the job position, to all of the various paths that that person might go through before that person finally feels kind of part of the establishment. I'm wondering, uh, and I know it's, it's you know, different from 1900 to yeah. 1920s and 30s and 40s and so on. But is there a sense of, uh, you know, to better appreciate the kind of challenges that person might face or, you know, again, what, what helps that person um, feel, you know, right where they are? Yeah. And I guess, I guess at present, the, uh, I think the average age of a steelworker is, what, around 50. Uh, so, so people aren't, you know, getting hired by, by large numbers anymore. Um, but there's an apprentice program. Do you want to talk to that us a little bit uh, about well how long that is and, and whether you're part of a group or just thrown out as individuals? That I wouldn't pretend to know. I've been out for out of the mill for 16 years, and when I hired in in 1963, it was uh, everybody I knew was going in the mill, yeah. except for the few that. Well, some people were getting drafted, and, uh, and, a, and, and a very few were going to college, but practically everybody that couldn't afford to go to college went in the mill. So you never felt uh, lonely in terms of uh, people around you who were your age and had similar interests and so on in those days. I would think that today it's a lot different because they hire so few people, and only really to replace people that have retired or moved on or whatever, uh, the, the workforce has been shrinking. Yeah. In those days, the workforce was huge. And uh, when you when you got there, as a uh, norm, normal age was 18 when you got out of high school. And uh, when you got there, the whole thing was kind of overwhelming. But again, there were a lot of other people your age who were there to, you know, commiserate with. I did a, I, did, I helped uh, former Lake County Sheriff Roy Dominguez write his autobiography called Valor, and he talks about you know, getting out of high school, uh, getting a job at the mill where he was making more money than his dad who had been working there 15, 20 years, and he could you know, buy a car and a stereo and move out of the house, and, and at some point you know, his dad said, you don't want to be here the rest of your life, and, and he'd always wanted to be a cop. And as, as dad said, you know, get, get the hell out of here. And so Roy went to college and later law school. And he was a state trooper for a while. But uh, they talked about the golden handcuffs that, that keep you there. Like Joe Gutierrez said, I never expected to be here beyond the summer. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you could make more money than a school teacher made. And so, uh, uh, and, and you weren't living with your parents or didn't have to like a lot of people today. You had a comment? As, go ahead. Question. Yeah. Can you describe the present uh, steel situation today in Northwest Indiana? It's you know it's interesting. A lot of people don't even a lot of people who aren't from this region don't don't even realize steel is still made, yeah. and 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 probably 
more than any place else in the country. And, um, but, it, but it's just not labor intensive anymore. And in fact, uh, when Ann Bailey was writing her book, Steel Closets, uh, what she found was, you know, people are working in the same place where there used to be tens of thousands of people. And now, you know, there's large parts of the mill that are deserted. Uh, where, you know, you're maybe walking along and, you know, wondering if you're a, a woman. Uh, you know, you're not seeing uh, many people. So it's a, it's the same, same plant, but, but uh, much, much fewer people there. And you, uh, you, you, you understand? You I had a couple of comments yeah. in re relationship to what he's asking. But in the 60s, um, I had heard stories of, and I, I had applied also at um, Inland and Youngstown, but it, <clears throat> they offered a job at uh, Youngstown. You could start on Monday. You went over to Inland, you could start that afternoon. <laughs> you took the first job that was available. Yeah. And uh, there was a big influx of people from the south that came up here. And that was part of, um, I know I talked to a couple people at Youngstown where <clears throat> that was part of their job. They went down there periodically, like monthly, and they'd go past a farm and say, hey, would you like to come up here and work at the mill? They'd give them car fare and enough money to get a hotel or whatever it was to get them through the first week. But there was a job. As soon as they said yes, they'd put them on a train and away they went, or a bus. When Puerto Ricans were recruited in 1948, they initially slept in Pullman cars. <coughs> and, and before that, during, during World War II, when, when a lot of people, like you say, were coming up from Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, the housing situation was so terrible in the industrial cities that some were living in uh, places like in Cedar Lake that had been summer shacks, uh, summer homes, and and there were buses that would, you know, three times a day go 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 out to Cedar Lake and and areas near there, Lowell, uh, to pick up mill workers who who didn't have their own their own automobiles. Uh, you couldn't buy a car during World War II if you didn't have one to start out and so yeah there was tremendous uh, uh, that, that was the real boom time uh, in World War II. Yeah. Actually there was a part in the, <clears throat> the weekend when they would call uh, 41 going south to Kentucky or Tennessee that's when they left their job and went back to the family so it was a long line of cars going south for the weekend wow. and come back on the morning on, on uh, Monday morning. I was wondering if, if Mike could talk a little bit about the environmental committee who was, who was on it at, at uh, Inlet's Hill. Oh, I could talk all night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get me started. Uh, in about 1970, 71, uh, at that particular point in time, I was uh, just starting to get active in the, in the local union. And uh, Coincidentally, uh, uh, the city councilman at that time, John Klobuchar, uh, was good friends with Jim Malinoff, who later became local union president. And we used to have our, our caucus meetings at uh, Big John's Tavern there in East Chicago. And uh, he told Jim uh, a story about fishermen in Lake Michigan that he knew that were going out and they were putting their lures in the water, their lines in the water, and their lures had come up black from the from the pollution. And uh, what it was, the Army Corps of Engineers at that time was dredging the Indiana Harbor Ship Canal because it fills up with gunk at the bottom and it becomes, uh, they couldn't get the ore boats in and out. And they would take these big clamshells and drag the stuff up, stir it up, and it was, it was mostly grease and suspended iron whatever crap and they would put it in big barges and barge it over to the inland steel landfill which inland was expanding constantly out into the lake so they, they put a big steel and concrete berm up out into the lake and then they dredged this stuff and were dumping it in there and on the, along the way the stuff was just leaking all over the place making a huge mess so uh, Obuchar told Balanoff, and we said, well, let's let's bring it up at the local union meeting and form a committee and try to figure out 
you know, what Hillen's role is in this. So we did. We went out and we took samples. We took them to a, uh, uh, an Inland Steel uh, stockholders meeting. We took jars of this stuff and told them, we raised our hands and told them we wanted to give them something. And we think this belongs to you. We're trying to get some, we're trying to get some, some news coverage of it. And uh, we went to the local union meeting and we passed a resolution to form an environmental committee. And so from that particular issue, we expanded and very quickly got involved with the coke ovens, which was the, probably the worst polluter in the whole area. Certainly the one, the, the most carcinogenic stuff was coming out of there. And it was an issue that really uh, uh, crossed lines because the people who worked in the coke plant were getting exposed to this pollutant, this, this uh, coal, coal tar pitch volatiles and it was causing high cancer rates, like we said in the, in the, uh, in the book. Uh, but the people in the community were exposed to the same stuff. So the Environmental Protection Agency was interested in it as a pollution source for the whole area, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration was interested as a, as a workplace health hazard. And we, with our committee, were trying to get the two of them to work together on this issue and solve the problem for everybody. So, like I said, I could go on with this. But that was, uh, there weren't too many environmental committees. We were the first. We were the first that I know of at a local union. Certainly the first permanent one, because when uh, Jim got elected to uh, the presidency, we we changed the bylaws and made it a permanent committee. Uh, so I think in, in steel, in the Steelworkers Union, we're the first one that I know of, certainly of any large local. And then when NIPSCO wanted to build this nuclear plant on the shore of Lake Michigan, not far from Bethlehem Steel, uh, the unions were very active against, uh, against uh, building that plant, which was really unusual uh, for, for a labor union to be pro-environmental uh, as opposed to pro-building uh, something. And, 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 and Oz was very active in that. Did you have a, uh, go ahead. Oh, one question, one question about, uh, I forget the, the businessman, the American businessman who went to Japan and modernized all of their, um, do you recall what his name is? I can't recall it now. Because he's considered, I understand from way back, yeah. documentaries I'd seen as a god to them in terms of what he was able to implement in terms of the mindset. Eric, modern. do we remember that? Yeah, Edward Deming. Deming. That's a good. Because I'm just wondering, um, as to the, the common laborer in any of the mills, uh, at that period of time, uh, you know, feeling, I would assume, some sense of invincibility, if you will, everything going great, and not seeing the writing on the wall of the things that were coming down as to being uncompetitive uh, in the steel. Um, what? Well, take us, if you can, back to that time. I mean, I'm just curious, uh, in terms of knowing more about um, any mis- I mean, what were people not paying attention to? Because I always like to make sure not to repeat any history uh, mistakes, if you will, uh, that might still be something that continues on in today's uh, ways of living. Well, I know, and, and Oz can talk about this better than I, but um, many rank and file unionists were very skeptical of the idea that we're all a family with uh, the same interests. Uh, where the truth is, management's interested in profit and and not the long-term welfare of its workers, uh, in my opinion, and probably in Oz's. But, yeah, but that was the spiel. That uh, let's let's adopt the Japanese model where we're all kind of uh, working on the same track. Yeah, that was one of the, the issues. The, the other thing they were were telling us at that in the early '70s, uh, the steel industry was complaining very loudly, and especially to uh, its own workforce and, it, and the unions representing those workforce that their uh, that our productivity was very low compared to the Japanese, uh, probably a five to one or a ten to one ratio. They were more productive than American steelworkers at that time. But what they were leaving out was the Japanese steel industry was completely rebuilt from scratch after World War II. They had all new, you know, they had basic oxygen process. They had all the latest. You know, <coughs> stuff, 
And the American steel industry didn't want to invest the money, so they were running open hearts that were 100 years old. And we knew that. So, I mean, you know, uh, the, the line that they tried to feed uh, the country at large and the steel workers, most steel workers weren't buying it because we knew the truth. And we knew why they weren't productive. And they were trying to get us to speed up, combine crews, you know, uh, eliminate jobs. And, and, and increase productivity that way to make up for, you know, a Japanese steel industry that was, uh, you know, using BOFs instead of open hearts. So there was, a, there was, there was head knocking to begin with over that. And uh, eventually, of course, they, they did uh, all of the above. I mean, they combined jobs, they eliminate jobs, they closed down the older plants, they put in new technology, they did it all, and now, for the last, oh, I'd say at least 10 or 20 years, uh, the American steel industry is the most productive in the world. Uh, which, which means, and going back to what somebody brought up, uh, at a place like Inland Steel, where we had, for many, many years, the workforce was about 18,000 union workers. And that was pretty stable for a lot of years. Uh, now it's about 2,000. They make just as much steel, they make better steel, and they make more money with a sixth of the number of people. So, and that's true of all the mills that are still open, the rest of them are closed. So that gives you an indication of what steel meant to the region and, what, and, and, the, and the, the number of people that were involved versus what there are now. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea, um, I was at a Sunday morning coffee group with a guy named Thomas Frank, not the famous one, listen liberal, but the one that married John Todd's daughter and lives in East Chicago. And basically, he's an environmental activist, and he's trying to say that the same thing will happen with the oil and gas industry that happened with the steel industry. That basically what they're going to try to do is with the tar sands coming in from northern Alberta where they're knocking down the boreal forest and bringing in this heavy crude, the, the, the footprint is going to be really big and it's going to be catastrophic there and here. And then all of a sudden, capital is going to decide that it's time to get out. What you've just described is what he's saying is going to happen to oil and gas. And, and so that it's like... The, as much as we try not to repeat history, unless we get out and get in people's faces about it, uh, they're going to try to repeat the same stuff all over again. And that, uh, he said one of the, one of the things that uh, has happened is that the Saudis come, have found a way to get more sweet crude and has driven the, the, the stuff in South Dakota, North Dakota, and Alberta out of the market. And that, that, may, that may give us five or six more years, but it's like, it's time to start looking at the oil industry again. I remember I, I hadn't been uh, here in the Midwest long and went to a city council meeting where the city of Gary wanted to pass a, uh, a, a, a clean air ordinance and U.S. Steel uh, was threatening to, well, we, we'll leave the area if such a thing passes. And, it passed and they didn't leave, but but that's been a constant as well. That, uh, telling unions, unless you do this, you know, we're just going to close up and go someplace else. You have a Thank you. So you are a transplant from elsewhere, and we've been talking about other trends around the country and the <coughs> world. And so I'm curious if you've ever had a chance to compare various industrial regions to Calumet and identify what what is different here, what is parallel to other areas. Yeah, that's that's very good. Um, yeah, we uh, Oz and I both went to a labor studies conference in Youngstown, and of course that whole Ohio Valley, I guess you'd call it, area, and Pittsburgh um, once was the, the center of the of the steel industry. So I so I have. Um, have studied what happened uh, there. 
in, 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 a, in a number of, of, of ways. Um, of course, the, uh, in studying the history of Gary, the, the city of Gary had absentee landlords. The top U.S. steel officials didn't live in Gary. Judge Gary only came here three times, never lived in Gary. And so, um, so one, one difference between Pittsburgh and Gary is that when these uh, millionaires wanted to uh, give their money to universities or museums or other cultural uh, enterprises, uh, that's where their money went. And, and so Gary does not have a, you know, the, the same kind of cultural amenities that, that a city like Pittsburgh benefited from because that's where the big honchos live. Um, but I, but I, um, I have some. I have done some of that, and and uh, because I was a member for many years of an international oral history association, I've I've also talked to uh, people in other countries that uh, that, that that whose field is uh, labor studies. So so I have done some of that. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, thank all everybody that read did a great job, so it made my job much much easier. Uh, thank you for that. And and you can repeat for those who were not here early when we started. Oh yes. Um, in uh, 45 minutes down in room 200, we have a presentation relating to the Pullman National Monument. And I think there will be food there as well as a bit of food we've had here. So um, if you'd like to stick around, um, catch a little bit of a, a concert that's going on at the moment, and then uh, hope maybe some of you can be in room 200 at 7 p.m. Again. Thank you so much. Okay, and I just want to remind everybody in May, uh, we'll have Victor Cassidy here. And then in September, uh, we have, we'll have Sue Bennett. So thank you all for attending, and um, we'll see you uh, a month from now.